wasn't it? I mean, it just, it was a magical show, for my money, it was a magical show up to the end of the Tom Baker period. It was just terrific. It was uh, Saturday evening entertainment, and we used to get 12 million people watching it. I mean, 12 million families sitting around their tellies watching this sh little movie you've made for yourself. And if, I may, if I may just jump in, and people are still watching those episodes. And, right? Yes. You know, for, yeah. what, 40 years? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I, I now, because of people like Ian, I get sent occasionally sort of um, DVDs and things of, uh, 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 of the shows I've done, and, uh, and I start looking at them because if I'm going to do a commentary or something, I don't want to go in, you know, hell. You know, I, I was doing them 40 years ago, 50 years ago, so clearly I don't remember them like yesterday. And I look at them, and I actually go, they're not bad. You know, they're... They're not bad shows. Yeah. So I mean, I, Doctor Who was um, Doctor Who. Uh, I think is a little part of television history. Blake Seven. Um, I was disappointed after the first one because it became like, if in a way, it became like Doctor Who. I was being employed to do visual effects rather than be in, you know, do something challenging in, in, in terms of storytelling, so it was less so. I, nothing wrong with Blake 7, I think it was a good show, but yeah, there's Doctor Who, there's Dad's Army, what else is there from that era? There's, uh, you know, there are half a dozen. Eight Half Hotman. Yeah, Eight Half Hotman, absolutely. There are those shows which are really part of television history, aren't they? Porridge. The, Porridge. 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 Yeah. Special time. And I'm not sure what you're, I mean, the bodyguard's very good. I, I thoroughly enjoy it. I mean, I live in Spain, so I don't see, uh, I don't see BBC or ITV or anything anymore. Um, but what I see, I don't, I, I love Walking Dead, but then that's, uh, not, I'm probably not appropriate for this audience. Oh, no, I'm sure we all, no, there's quite a few Walking Dead fans like that. Um, any questions from the audience for Michael? Let's go to you first, I saw. When you were making Doctor Who, how hard or easy was it to stick to a BBC budget? To, to stick to a BBC budget? Um, the, there was a rule as a director that part of the job was doing it in the time for the money. Um, and not just Doctor Who, but any show if you overspent, it had better be bloody good because the producer would really seriously think twice about employing you again. As a freelance, um, you really needed to look, you know, you needed three or four producers who wanted to employ you. So sticking to a budget, like in the Sea Devils, I wanted to have, um, when, they were when they were underground in the Sea Devils living quarters, I wanted to have a, a chroma key tank at the bank and I was going to have little model sea devils but you know, blow them up to look big, swimming underwater and then coming up on a beach and coming up on land and going into the sea. And by the time I got to, that was episode six I think, by the time I got there there wasn't the budget for it and I had the choice, I could overspend or do it in the time for the money and so I did it in the time for the money because I wasn't sure Nobody, know, nobody knows when you're making a show. You don't know if it's going to be popular or not. You don't know if it's going to be a success or not. Um, and very often the ones that you think are surefire winners bomb, and the ones that um, you go, yeah, well, like robots. I never thought anybody else would like I, I liked robots. It was fun to do because it was outrageous. Uh, you know, the, the male cost, the male makeup, the, the costumes, these camp robots, the whole thing. And I was doing it for me, really, because that was the way I saw it. But I had no idea that it was going to become a, you know, a successful show. You can't tell. You really can't tell. The sea Devils coming out of the sea, the one that scared me the most as a child. Sorry, say again? The Sea Devils coming out of the sea. Yeah, so well, that, that was... The most as a child. That was, I mean, that was another budgetary thing. I mean, I, I only had four Sea Devils. So um, I had planned, I did it with two cameras, I had two cameras on vacation, two, two film cameras on vacation. I had planned to do five, I put five or six different shots planned, but it was the last day of filming. Um, I was due to finish shooting at six o'clock in the evening. Um, it got late. I, I, I had planned to start doing the sea devil shooting around 
four, I think, so I had two hours to do all these shots. And come six o'clock, I did this one shot with two cameras and went, well, I can overspend and the entire crew can be late getting back from um, Cowes, it wasn't Cowes, Bembridge, I think it was, um, back to London and get into overtime and lots and lots of money, or I can stop there. So I, I stopped there. It, it's a judgment call. And in fact, I think it, it's strange. The, that shot of the, there's only four of them yeah. coming out of the sea, those two shots seem to, seem to visually have satisfied most people who see that story. They, like, it's, they think it's okay. It's had a huge <coughs> visual impact on yes. Doctor Who fans. Yeah, it, it, I mean, it was, <coughs> it was quite, I planned it quite carefully. Because I sail, I knew a little bit about tides. So I knew a little bit about how tides worked and where, and where they would be. So a bit of the planning was to do with where the tide would be. And it was about um, knowing how far out I could send the stuntmen. They're all four were stuntmen um, coming out. And, um, and the fact that I'd worked out quite a good system that, OK, guys, you'll walk out there. You stand there you know, when you're that deep. And when I shout, go, you all go down underwater, count up to four, and then come up again. I mean, it's as simple as that, but, but you have to work it out. And that's what happened. And, they half drowned the poor, <laughs> poor guys because all the masks filled up with water and didn't drain away because they were closed up round. They were closed up round there, and it all come in through all the other orifices. So, so there were actually those sea devils were going. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your question. Any other questions from the audience? Uh, let's go to the gentleman just over there. On the left. Yeah. A lot of your stories have actors um, in full face masks um, with no. Ability to project, but the robots and the sea devils give really good performances. And yes. Arnold Garrow as Bilal is just—he's he's one of my favourite performances. Is there a, a knack to working with actors when they can't use their face to express? Um, traditionally, things like robots and monsters and things were played by extras or walk-ons, um, and with. First of all, with the Sea Devils, um, I was very keen to use actors and, and pay actors who read the script and said the lines. And with the Sea Devil masks, I got visual effects and sound department to build microphones into the existing masks, um, which is what they did. And it was a total disaster. Um, in the studio, when you were recording it, uh, there was there was howl round. There was um, uh, the microphones just didn't work in those masks because it was, you know, I confess it was a bit of an afterthought that we put the. Originally, I thought the sea devils would speak and we'd have a, you know, so it didn't work that well. So in post production, I actually had to post sync. I then I got all the sea devils then to do their dialogue. Um, The sound supervisor said, it isn't working, Michael. We've got to do something about it. So at the end of each scene, each sea devil would then do his dialogue into a microphone without the head on. Um, and we later, in the dub, matched up everything into it. So when I came to robots having learned a lesson, um, I had the sound guys involved in the designing of the masks so that they could put the radio mics in a good position that would enable the robots to, to speak. And again, I employed actors, you know, Miles Volgill, uh, Gregory de Polnay. I mean, they were all good quality actors playing those robots um, and able to do their dialogue. And I think it worked well. You know, I think the fact that there is a body language, isn't there, that an actor uses? I mean, you, um, the whole way you walk and everything it, 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 it is part of your character. So I thought the robots, even though they walked slightly, very slightly oddly, um, the fact that the actor was using his own voice in sync with his movements, I think was something that gave the robots a quality that was unexpectedly real, was unexpectedly good. That soft, pleasant voice was really rather nice. Michael, are you aware of the, the legacy of robots of death? 
Are you aware that there's been uh, an audio spin-off series, that no big finish, you do Doctor Who audio? Never told me, brother. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not paying me. <laughs> and uh, Big Finish and I, which have the license to do Doctor Who on radio drama, on audio, yeah. Uh, I do a, a series with Yeah, absolutely unaware of it. Absolutely unaware of it. I mean, I'd like it, but yeah, yeah that's great. Would you ever direct audio? Would you ever like to have a go at directing, say, Doctor Who as an audio? Well, yeah, I can I look at it in, in the end, in the end, you have to admit that time has gone by. And I actually. I don't think physically I could direct a, um, a Doctor Who anymore. I just don't think I could. The pressures are big. You know, being a director is not, you know, it's a high pressure job, but I don't think I could do it. Doing audio, I, as a young actor, I did um, one radio show as, a, as an actor, and I actually found it terrifying. Um, because all the other, I was surrounded by all the actors in this recording studio, and they'd all be sitting in a chair like this, and about the, at about two lines before they um, had to emote, uh, they'd get up from the chair and wander across the microphone, do their dialogue in character with the right intonation, absolutely brilliantly, and then uh, do another one, and then just go back and sit down. I was sitting there in my chair, sort of quivering with my script going. So I found it very difficult. I found audio quite challenging. I can't direct it. I don't know. I'm not sure. Mind you. All the television is, is radio with pictures, yeah. isn't it, that somebody said? You know, it's just radio with pictures. Yeah. Well, I suppose it's a completely different skill set as well. It's radio with pictures. Yeah. I mean, without the audio, television is nothing, is it? Unless it's Benny Hill. <laughs> but even then it's done it that yeah. yeah. <laughs> Any other questions from the audience at all? Let's just move away from Doctor Who. At the moment, I think we need to just quickly, briefly mention two other shows, two iconic shows that you worked on. Um, I'm not talking about EastEnders and Howard's Way. I'm talking about um, <laughs> Secret Army and Kessler. Oh yes. I mean, absolutely amazing BBC productions. Yeah. I mean, yeah. what are your memories of? of I uh, I was I was just thrilled when um, Jerry Glaster offered me Secret Army. Um, I, uh, I went for an interview with him. I mean, directors go for interviews as well. I mean, you go to me, if, if a producer wants, uh, is a big producer, if they didn't know you and they think you might be right for their production, um, call you in and have a chat to you. Um, and I was called in, my, my agent got me a interview with um, Jerry Glaster. Uh, and I went into the interview um, prepared to talk about, you know, the meaning of drama and the meaning of life and, you know, how important I thought the world was and all that sort of thing. And he talked about fishing and I talked about sailing for an hour. And I walked out of the office um, and thought, shit, I've blown it. I mean, you know, we've not discussed, we've not discussed Secret Army. We've not, we've not talked about drama. We haven't talked about anything like that. Um, and somebody else said to me, did he talk to you about the production? I said, no, not at all. He said, okay, well, you probably got the job then. Because if he liked you, he talked about fishing. And if he didn't like you, he talked about the secret army. So yeah, I got it. And I, and I walked into that rehearsal room again, really, really nervous, really scared. Um, the actors, you know, the actors were of such stature in the show. And I thought it was such an important show. I, I, I was, I absolutely, I, I considered when I did Secret Army, I thought I'd totally arrived as a director. I thought it was the most grown up thing and I was, I was just thrilled with it. I just loved it. Angela, 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 who played the lady who sang in Candide, um, had, was a mega um, theatre star. You know, she was lead in musicals in the West End. Bernie Hepton, Clifford Rose, I mean, great. Super actors, really serious classical actors, and um, and the rehearsal room was very serious. It didn't mean it was morbid or unhappy, but it was you were working very, very seriously to work out what scenes were about, the best way of presenting them, the best way of doing it. It was, it, I mean, it was magical. Couldn't wait to go to work on Monday morning when I was doing Secret Army. Absolutely great. Yeah. We're almost running out of time, but I just I want to 
end on asking you this, if I may. You sort of, you kind of disappeared in the 90s. You know, there was no more directing from you. You've gone off to be sailing and you've had amazing adventures, which sadly we don't have the time to, to uh, talk about. I mean, you were boarded by pirates at one time and, I mean, some really scary things have happened to you. But your body of work of Doctor Who, are you aware, or were you aware at this time, at that time, up until a few years ago, how many lives you have touched and your work has, has had? I wasn't, I've, I've always loved Doctor Who because it taught me my trade. And it gave me opportunities to um, work with some incredibly talented people. Uh, I mean, not just the actors, but the set designers, the costume designers, the makeup people, the sound people, the um, music people. Um, so I've always had, I've always had an enormous respect for the production. And, and because I've worked, you know, from the first day at the BBC to becoming a freelance director, uh, it's had an enormous impact on my life. So I've always been fond of it, but no, I mean, I, I didn't actually disappear. I, I got offered a job in Holland for, in Amsterdam for three months. What sort of job was that? Well, no, that was actually, do, that was actually doing, a, they wanted to do a soap. They wanted to do a, um, um, a bi week well, they wanted to do a film first, so it didn't happen there, but it turned into a soap. So I did this soap called Spiker Hook, which nobody's heard of. Oh my God, Hmm? <laughs> you know Spike Hook? <laughs> then you're then you're under. Under. <laughs> um, yeah, well I did Spike Hook, which was quite successful. It was quite different from other shows. And then they came to me, then Jörg van der Ender, who um, is a big producer in the Netherlands, I mean mega uh, in the Netherlands, one of two huge producers there, came to me and said, um, we are going to do a situation comedy, Michael, and I would like you to direct it. And I went, you know, come on. I'm a drama director. I don't even know how to spell situation comedy, far as direct it. Uh, and he said, no, no, no. Um, I, I said, well, show me, show, me the, um, show me the script, show me the tape, please, and I'll, I'll have a look at it. And he came along with this tape of a German sitcom written by some English people and I took it home and looked at it, and it was dire. I mean, it was so unfunny and so badly done and so badly. It had no merit whatsoever. Um, and because I actually thought, yeah, I can just go back to England and pick up where I left off. I, you know, I said to you, um, no, I, um, I, um, I don't, uh, I, I really, with the greatest respect, you, I don't want to do this. And I really suggest that you don't do it because it's pretty awful. So he said, well, if it's so awful, what do you think is better? I don't know. Uh, so he said, well, um, send me, uh, I would like tomorrow in my office, I would like, um, I, would like uh, I would like to see what you think is better in the way of sitcoms. So I phoned my agent uh, and said, what do we know about sitcoms? What sitcoms are there? And he looked at his shelf where oh, whenever his actors um, did a production, he would have copies of the production to send to directors. So he took down um, Fools and Horses, Butterflies, um, The Two of Us, um, After Henry, and a, a couple more sitcom productions, couriered them over to me. I sent them over to Yo, uh, and the next day Yo came into came into my office and uh, and said, um, "Yes, uh, I have bought the rights to all these productions." <laughs> <laughs> you bought the rights to seven productions. I bought the rights to all these productions. Which one do we do? So I'm, like, oh, I'm not a sitcom person. I, don't, I haven't seen half of them. I've just got these tapes from my agent. So I said, yeah, just, "Just let me think about it, Yo." So I get on. One of the big things I've found in life is that you should always ask an expert. If you've got an expert with you, ask an expert. Don't make it up yourself. Ask an expert. So I called my agent and said, um, what do you reckon? What, what should we do? He wants to do, he's bought the rights and we want to do it. He said, um, he said, do the two of us because it's only got two characters in it 
Um, it's very funny. It's a boy and a girl character, and there's an uncle, and there's a. I, I don't know if anybody remembers yeah. it from yeah. there. Uh, and and it's only two sets. And I was to do it like a British sitcom is done, um, with a four days rehearsal, fifth day in the studio before a live audience about this size, uh, and you record it in an hour and a half. So it's, you know, it's a it's quite a challenge if you haven't done that sort of thing. Um, so I went to Yoke and said, I think we should do, um, in my opinion, you know, we should do the two of us. He said, right. He said, okay, we do the two of us. The only thing is, um, the contract I've signed says we're going to do Friends for Life. So it will be called Friends for Life, not Frienden for Hedleben in uh, Netherlands. Um, so we did Frienden, we did Friends for Life, Frienden for Hedleben. We did the British series ran for 26 episodes, I directed 26, and they then brought in other writers. Um, they got the original writer to write more things, and they are began to sort of walk away from it. And I actually won, and it's, you know, it is a matter of immense pride, I won Drama Director of the Year for my situation comedy. <laughs> <laughs> Out of time, Michael. Sorry. I no, no, no. Michael, you are truly a legend in the world of Doctor Who. And thank you for travelling all these miles <laughs> to, to be with us. It's got, it's got nothing to do with the fact that I'm moving to France and I'm buying, I'm signing for my flat on front. <laughs> <laughs> nothing to do with that at all. Nothing to do with that. Michael will be still signing for uh, a few minutes um, down in the room where we were in the. Where is it? The studio. Thank you. Well. So if anybody still wants to get um, an autograph, Michael is very rarely in the country, so please come and complete your collection. Ladies and gentlemen, the legend, Michael E. Bryant. <laughs> I really enjoy meeting people who like the show and ask me, um, who talk to me about it. And I find it immensely flattering and it is such a pleasure to be here, I can't tell you. I really enjoy it. It's, it's wonderful. I'm, I'm grateful to you people. Ladies and gentlemen, Michael E. Bryant.